Hey folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to a brand new Let's Play for Darkest Dungeon. Darkest Dungeon is an indie RPG, roguelike-y kind of thing. You know, one of those games that can be a little hard to describe, but I will tell you this, it is absolutely stunningly amazing. It has a beautiful sort of comic book aesthetic, and again, I, I realize here in, in this particular view it might look a little flat and boring, but that's because this game has kind of a, of, of a meta management aspect to it. While it is, you know, calling it roguelike is actually pretty apt, in fact, probably more apt than what a lot of things are being called roguelike these days, but instead of controlling just one person, you've got a slew of adventurers that you can send into these dungeons. When they die... They are permanently death. The dungeons are all procedural. Um, they are randomized. You don't know what's going to happen every time you go in there. And it is also brutally, brutally hard. It is very easy for people to die. This is, I want to load up one of my existing games just to be able to sort of demonstrate a few of the features. But we are going to be starting a fresh campaign in just a few minutes in this video. So you can see here, this is a town. The story is your grandpa, uncle, something like that, some family member had this mansion in this town and um i don't know i guess he dug too deeply and greedily beneath it and unleashed all manner of horrors so now it is your job to send your group of people down into various aspects of the dungeon to clear it out so there's a few little differently themed areas the ruins the warrens the wheel these have all been unlocked so far in this game i haven't unlocked the cove yet and ultimately there will be the actual darkest dungeon that you can try to get through um, they tend to have goals. If we take a look at here, um, this ruins map is a cleanse mission, uh, which means I will have to clear out every room in here that has a monster. I'll have to kill all the monsters, basically. I don't actually have to clear out the entire map necessarily, but because I don't know where the monsters are, you still tend to map to, to clear out a lot. This one here is just explore 90% of the rooms, for example. In practice, they tend to feel relatively samey, the mission, but it can it can matter because it's like when you're, you're down to your last dying breath and you're trying to figure out if you can complete the mission or not. You can back out early early if you want to, but then you don't get the actual quest reward, although you do get to carry out whatever you may have uh, found with you. Also, what's very important is when you leave, if you escape a dungeon, if you run away, if you abandon it, all your people get some extra stress. And stress is the most important resource, I think, in this game. It's got a very sort of Cthulhu-esque kind of feel where your characters will slowly go mad or sometimes very quickly go mad. Um, you can see that here people... Uh, are complaining about their status. If I take a look at this character over here, Vesky, my high women, for example, he, this white bar here represents his stress level. He's currently at 91 of 100. He's almost completely stressed out, absolutely. If I were to bring him into a dungeon right now, all kinds of things could result in more stress. Simply being in more darkness, triggering a trap, maybe being hit by a critical hit. Certainly, if one of his teammates or himself got low in health, um, he would get a lot of stress. In fact, when someone gets very low in health or gets critted, everyone in the group tends to develop a lot of stress. If your stress level hits 100%, you tend to develop some sort of like really weird affliction. Uh, sometimes you can become so depressed that you will refuse help from your teammates. You may not act, or maybe you will act rashly, and uh, your your units will attack units uh, enemies sort of at random without your input, for example. Uh, but every now and again, something really good can happen. Someone can get a boost of courage because things get so desperate. They they tap into some extra inner reserve of adrenaline. Every character has got a different set of skills. There are a handful of different classes. You can see here I've got a Highwayman, I've got a Crusader. Uh, everyone starts the game generally with a Crusader and a Highwayman. I've also got a Vestal over here, sort of a priestly type person, a Plague Doctor. Uh, you got another Highwayman, I've got some more Crusaders, I've got a Grave Robber, I've got a Hellion, which is kind of a Berserker. And this is far from all the classes that are available. Um, I've built up a bit of a roster here, which is important because they do need to rest. So this whole stress thing, hit points, when you finish a dungeon, any damage that you had goes away, but the stress remains. You can see here, he's, uh, he is very, very stressy. So, uh, also he's got a set of quirks. Everyone has quirks. The things on the left are positive. The ones on the right are negative. Uh, so for example, he will never drink in town. And why is that important? Well, if you go to somewhere like a tavern, it's one of the places where you can have stress relief and you can send someone to the bar to drink, to the gambling hall. To, to gamble or to the brothel although the caretaker of the town is currently occupying that slot he's always somewhere every every week he's in a different slot and yeah, uses it up so um vesky over here i cannot put him in the bar because he's not willing to drink so um it limits some of the stress options especially when you've got a lot of people that you're trying to de-stress um, some people will only do one thing like some people will only ever be willing to go to the abbey and pray 
So this is the only slot you can put them in for that stress relief. Um, so I hope this gives you a little bit of a concept as to what kind of stuff you're going to be dealing with in the game. Um, this doesn't actually show you any of the combat, but we are going to start to encounter some of that right away in the next part of the video. Again, I will remind you at the start of the game, you only start with two characters. Normally, you always go into a dungeon with four and you get a big choice of people to to go with and everyone's got randomized ability. Two plague doctors will have a different set of starting abilities and some abilities synergize with one another. For example, you can get bounty hunters later on that do bonus damage when they're hitting something that's stunned. So you want to combine them with someone who's got the ability to stun an enemy. I think um, this fellow here is a stunning blow, for example. Um, so you stun here and then use the bounty hunter to do bonus damage. It is a brilliant, lovely game with a great comic book aesthetic, especially once you start going. It's not noisy in terms of visual, but I think it's, I think it's just just right. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it and uh, catch you on the flip side. All right, let's go ahead and start our new campaign over here. So the reason that I wanted to uh, show an existing game first is because at first there's a slightly limited set of options as they're trying to um, basically have a, almost a built-in tutorial, right? You limit your options, you teach people to play step by step, and I didn't want anyone to think that there wasn't a good amount of gameplay variety. There's a great cutscene that's going to start off here. There's actually one when you start the game as well, but this is the intro of us coming to town. There's this great comic book art style like an animated comic book art style and very sort of gothic and macabre and uh, Cthulhu-esque craziness. I like the voice acting quite a bit too. Serpent-like suggestion through the corrupted countryside. Leading only, I fear, to ever more tenebrous places. There is a sickness in the ancient pitted cobbles of the old road and on its writhing path you will face viciousness violence, and perhaps other damnably transcendent terrors. I guess this is a continuation from the letter that we received from our family member, so warning us about yourself. what the road's going to be like. Remember, there can be no bravery without madness. The old road will take you to hell, but in that gaping abyss, we will find our redemption. Dun, dun, dun. All right, and then it'll drop us basically in the sort of the dungeon mode, a, a lightweight version of the dungeon mode, um, where after we crash over here, we have to get to the town itself. So we start off with only two characters. We've got uh, a crusader over here. I'm going to go ahead and rename these guys uh, based on some viewers. So, of course, you're probably going to die a very short and bloody death. So sorry about that. So we're going to have Hadros, our seeker crusader. And we're going to have Dismas over here, our highwayman. Or rather, he's going to be Krakenbrow. Now, I believe everyone starts the game with these two characters, a crusader and a highwayman. Uh, and I believe the abilities will always be the same. But the characters that you will be able to recruit as you play will be different on every playthrough. And not only that, but if you recruit the same like character class, like if you recruit another highwayman, for example, he will likely have a different mix of abilities. So there's going to be quite a bit of variety in there. Again, I like the uh, the comic booky kind of art style. I mean, there's not a lot going on visually. There's not a lot of visual noise, which it can be good, it can be good, bad, different things like that. But um, I think it executes its job very well. There's a uh, a lighting system over here, which will become more important once we get into the dungeons. Right now, there's not much, um, and so all there is for us to do now is on the the map. Um, of our quote-unquote dungeon, not that this is a real dungeon because it's the tutorial area, we have to pick the next room we're going to travel to. This is where we are, and we only have one option, so I'm going to go ahead and say move to that room. So then it'll put us on this path. These lanes. Keep to the side path. The hamlet is just ahead. So this path will have up to four spots where various types of encounters may occur. And that encounter might be something like a trap, maybe a chest, or even some villains, for example. Uh, so what we do is we walk around as a party this way, and we may or may not run into something. And in this case, the tutorial is completely scripted in terms of what you will get, but the actual gameplay is very procedural with a lot of variety every time. So now we are in combat, and uh, Krakenbrow over here has rolled the highest initiative, so he will get first. If we take a look, he's got a speed of six, 
Um, Hadros has a speed of zero, actually, so he's not very quick. And this um, Brigand over here has a speed of three. But it is get rolled every time. Um, I don't know exactly how all the mechanics work. Uh, a lot of that hasn't been discovered or announced yet. I'm sure there will be plenty of wikis as time goes on, but we're currently still in the pre-release phase. So there's probably some sort of percentage die roll because we might not always win. But as it is now, Krakenbrow does have the initiative. So you can see here we cannot use our pistol shot ability. And that's because while we are in the right position for the pistol shot, uh, now you got to imagine that normally we'd have four characters. So right now he is in the second slot. And if we look here, the pistol shot can be used in any slot other than in the first position. However, he can't use it to hit anyone who's in the first position. So that's why it's grayed out and unusable. I could use the grape shot blast because as long as we're in the middle two positions, we can use that and it'll hit everyone in the first three spots. It's actually quite good, but you can see it only does half damage. Um, and that's because it's hitting three people. So actually, when you do the math, it's effectively doing 150% damage, um, but spread out along three people. Now, whether it's better to focus fire on someone or to use these uh, AoEs for more efficiency is going to depend very much on the fight and your situation. We've got a take aim ability. We can use it whenever we want. It'll give us a buff. That'll give us plus four accuracy and plus five percent crit. I'm not entirely sure how long it lasts, actually. And then over here, we've got a, an attack called Open Vein. We can use it in the first three spots and attack anyone in the first two. Uh, it does have a slight damage debuff, 15% less damage, but it's pretty accurate, and a target will bleed for two points round for three rounds. Considering we're looking to do something like five to 11 damage, that bleed is quite potent, although this will be a short fight. Right now, we're just going to go ahead and use the Open Veins. Oh, we actually dodged. Little, little fun animations that tend to happen. Oh, here's a good example. So the Brigand had a speed of three, and uh, Hadros only has a speed of zero, but he still went ahead of the Brigand. It just happened to work out that way. So uh, we've got a basic attack here with the Smite, which does full damage, including more damage against unholy creatures, although this is a human. Zealous Accusation, which spreads damage in the first two. A Stunning Blow, which does two-thirds less damage, but has a... 100% stun chance. However, their stun resistance gets res um, subtracted from that, so effectively I think we'd have a 75% chance to stun him. And then finally I can turn on Bulwark of Faith, which uh, increases our lighting, which you can see has dropped here. The darker things get, the more monsters tend to have benefits. Uh, this will actually increase our, our um, torch level and give me 20% more protection, which makes us a little bit tanky. I think, um, you know what, let's use the Stunning Blow. So we're going to turn that on and we're going to target him. In for five damage, and he was stunned. He did not resist the stun. So that was his action just now, which allowed him to shake off the stun, but he didn't actually get to act, which is great. Let's go ahead and try to hit him with the, um, it's called Open Vein again. So now we've hit him, and he bled as well. He does have a bleed resistance. There would have been a 25% chance for him to resist that. And on his turn, he took the two points of bleed damage, which finished him off. The bleed damage does stack, which is interesting. If I hit him the first time, and assuming he doesn't resist the bleed, then he'll take two points of bleed damage per round. If I hit him with another bleed attack, the damage adds up. So if I hit him with the open veins twice in a row, he'll now be taking four points of damage per round, and the duration gets reset. So if you hit him once, and then he bleeds for a couple rounds, he's only got one round of bleed left, and then I hit him with open veins, it'll still be reset to four damage per round for three rounds, as far as I can tell, which means bleed can stack pretty interestingly. We got a little bit of gold. Everything's got a really great description. I love the one for the gold. Gold greases palms, builds empires, and instigates murder. We got 50 gold pieces, which is not a terribly high amount. We're going to keep moving forward over here. We took no damage in that fight, which is great. Ah! We've got a tent we can interact with. Now, some things are better to be interacted with with different people. I haven't really figured out the system completely. I can tell you that Krakenbrow does have a 20% chance uh, to resist traps, whereas Hadros does not, although Hadros does have more hit points. I'll go ahead and use Krakenbrow, my highwayman over here. Try to loot that. Sometimes there'll be a, an item that you'll have in your inventory that can help you interact with something. Brigands left valuables. We got 50 gold and some Onyx, which is worth 500 bucks. We'll take all that and move to the end. And then if we click on the gate, we'll actually enter the next area. And I happen to know in this tutorial that will be a bigger fight. Send these vermin a message. The all right. owner has returned, and their kind is no longer welcome. So, round one, this guy actually won the initiative completely, even though he only had a speed of one. Um, and he was able to use his point blank shot ability that we talked about uh, in the first bit to actually knock back my crusader which is 
not 100% ideal, but also isn't the end of the world because he should be able to attack pretty easily. Now, what's interesting here is my open veins can attack anyone in the first two spots, right? But if I've got it clicked, you'll see there's not a sort of highlight around this brigand's health bar, which means I can't actually attack him with the open veins. Why is that? Well, it's because this dude here, this blood letter, is actually a double wide enemy. He takes up the first two spots, and therefore, I can't actually reach the guy in the back. As far as I can tell, he will not take additional damage from splash damage, though. Like, for example, on um, Hadros over here, my Zealous Accusation, which hits the first two slots for, for damage, I don't believe this guy will take double damage from that. I might be wrong, we'll find out at some point. Anyway, it seems like the only sensible thing to do at this point is probably to start hacking away with open veins. We could do one take aim first. But I think we're going to want to start to apply some damage ASAP and especially try to get that bleed. He did not resist the bleed, so he's going to take two damage per round. Got a lot of hit points, though. Oh, he used um, the splash attack damage here. So now, Hadros, I can um, move. So here, uh, Hadros has a move one ability. Um, does it tell me what his move is? No, maybe not unless I've got him selected, as far as I can tell. Some people have a move two ability, so they can move up to two slots. Hadros can, the Crusader can only move one. I don't think I feel the need to move him. A stunning blow might be a good idea. Oh, no, this Brigand has a 50% stun resist chance, so I think that might be a waste. I'll go ahead and just try to beat him down with smite, just try to apply as much damage as possible. But you can see here the Zealous Accusation does not highlight the second person. Yeah, we'll just try to hit them as quickly as possible, just burn this big guy down because he's pretty dangerous. Round two, new initiative roll. Brackenbrow got to start off with. And yeah, he's got... Okay, it still says move one, but he can move up to two slots in either direction. So it might be a factor of his speed or, or something. I'm not sure. Still learning the game. Still pre-release days, so obviously a lot of information will come out over time. But for now, we've got that. Let's go ahead and keep applying that. So now he's going to be bleeding for four points of damage per round. And again, the duration is three rounds, so it stacks up. We're taking a lot of splash damage here. Rain of Whips will also be some splash damage, but both my characters dodged. So as far as I can tell, so everyone's got an accuracy rating, and I think what happens is both the accuracy and the dodge gets rolled, or maybe it's just the accuracy gets rolled, and then he has to exceed the dodge. I'm not sure about the mechanics. Here, he probably just made a really low roll. Sometimes uh, those splash attacks will hit, you know, some but not all of the opponents. A lot of times you will see a splash damage miss everyone or hit everyone and I think it's just a side effect of having rolled very high or very low on your accuracy attack anyway he's down to five hit points which we should be able to finish off as long as we hit because we do seven to thirteen damage he does have a little bit of um, protection potentially but it looks like we're okay he's got no dodge ability that so should land pretty easily it looks like there's no real it'd be nice to do some splash but we'll just finish him off with smite and that'll be okay perhaps the turning point Round three, and this guy's only got 12 hit points. If we got lucky with a crit, we would have been able to kill him off right away. He is going to get a little bit more of an attack, but hit point damage doesn't really matter. We are going to successfully finish this dungeon, and once we get to town, we will be fully healed. The only thing is stress that doesn't fully heal. And one of the ways to lose stress is to get low in health. Um, or worse, if someone uh, gets... Uh, gets to within like a death blow range, the entire party will take massive amounts of stress, which is bad. So we got some bandages, which can prevent bleeding, jade, which is worth money, and we got a deed and a portrait. These are resources that you use to upgrade your buildings in town. We have completed the quest because we have killed everything off, but before we're gonna go, we're gonna make sure to loot the chest. Oh, it could be trapped. We're gonna hope that uh, Krakenbrow can open it up. It is indeed trapped, and we got blighted, so we didn't get to loot it, which is too bad. But we can now officially just go ahead and complete the quest, and that's going to be fine. We maybe get another cutscene here, maybe not, I'm not sure. We got 5,000 gold for completing the quest. We turned in some treasure, the gold, the onyx, and the jade, so a little bit of extra money. And we collected the heirlooms, the one portrait and the two deeds. We'll go ahead and hit next. We got a little bit of resolve XP. So basically, the, the levels that you get represent resolve, which is how uh, good they are, if nothing else, at resisting stress. In particular, you don't want to send people in a dungeon that is a higher level than they are, or they will experience too much stress. And sometimes you will get a new quirk on this victory screen, or defeat screen. Well, if you get defeated by everyone dying, then they're just Welcome gone. Home, such as it is. It is? Oh, more text. Hamlet, these corrupted lands. They are yours now, and you are bound to them. Um, it is permadeath. If one of your characters dies in a dungeon, they are just simply dead and gone and no longer available. So anything you invested in them is gone. Um, some of them are going to be better than others, depending on their traits, and you're going to want to babysit those very, very highly, to the point where you might actually be willing to sort of sacrifice other people in exchange for having someone else make it out of a dungeon, even if you don't successfully do it. 
Tons of goals and quests to look after. Lots and lots of content available. I love the activity log. This will fill up with a lot of interesting stuff, especially as people perform various rests. Um, yes, you can hold H whenever you want to get some assistance. Very, very handy. Here's the list of all the different buildings that we're going to be able to interact with eventually. However, right now, we only have two places. The graveyard, where we can see Most will end up here, our fallen people. Poisoned earth, awaiting merciful oblivion. But we don't have anyone dead yet. You can see every now and again they will say something about not wanting to go and fight again. It's creepy. It's Cthulhu-esque. It's, it's a sanity beatdown. Then we've got the stagecoach over here. With very, very men, useful. Soldiers and outlaws. Fools and corpses. All will find their way to us now that the road is clear. So right now we've got the ability to hire a plague doctor and a vestal, a priest. I believe... Um, every, every test I've done, I feel like you automatically get these the first week, uh, which is a good way to round out your, your party because the Vestal tends to have some amount of healing, although it will be different every time. Um, she has a dazzling light ability that she can use from the rear ranks, increases torches and, ooh, good chance to stun. Only just half damage, but if it's got a good chance to stun and gives us a bit of lighting, it's a nice support ability. It's also got a, she's got a direct heal, heals three to five. Uh, an Illumination, which also increases our torch lighting uh, level and can hit anyone, basically, as long as she's not in the rear ranks. And reduces the target's dodging ability, which is nice to have. And a Hand of Light, which is actually a front rank attacking ability, which is quite interesting. Um, usually, or not usually, but uh, the first time I played through the Vestal that was available actually had the Divine Comfort ability, which is a big party heal, for example. And uh, so every time you get something slightly different. But as far as I can tell, you got a Vestal and a Plague Doctor every time. The Plague Doctor's got some variety of interesting abilities. Ooh, I don't think I've seen one with Incision before. You can do a little bit of bleed. Not as much as the Highwayman, but not bad. But not only that, uh, he can use Battlefield Medicine on himself. Or a target. Actually, I think it does both. I think you can target someone else. It will stop them from bleeding and being blighted, but it will also do the Plague Doctor at the same time. I'm pretty sure is what this text means. Emboldening Vapors. Uh, looks like that's a buff he can put on someone and make them do extra damage. I actually haven't seen this one before at all. And Noxious Blast, which I'm used to seeing. Uh, very nice rear rank nuke ability that uh, does one third less base damage but blights for two points per round which is pretty strong and this does not stack with bleed it is but it works very much the same way some things can't be bled undead cannot bleed for example uh, but they can still be blighted he's got a couple of negative twer uh, quirks he <laughs> twerks <laughs> um, he will only visit the brothel for stress relief so only the brothel will allow him to be relieved of stress which is not good because it really cuts back on your stress relief options he also uh, gets less speed if light is above 75. And this is really bad because with your adventuring party, you usually want to keep the light quite high because it's good for you and bad for the monsters. So he'll actually be sitting around with a negative two speed penalty quite frequently, except when light gets too low. He is thick blooded. He's got some blight resistance. He's a fast healer, which is good too. And some, you know, stats and starting gear. I mean, we don't have much of a choice. We're going to go ahead and grab them anyway. What's uh, the Seeker's abilities? The blood -soaked battlefield. She takes less stress damage, does bonus damage while she's in the warrens. She does have a creeping cough, which is minus five uh, accuracy, minus five dodge, minus one speed. That's particularly bad. Hopefully we can get it to heal at some point, but we'll go with there. We... Battle, pious and unrelenting. I like the, the dialogue. It's great. We are going to go ahead and upgrade the stagecoach. In particular, I'm going to want to make sure that for next week, if possible, I have four heroes available for myself. Because these four are going to have to go and do an adventure. You have to send four people in uh, to all dungeon crawls. And they might be too stressed out. Or they might all die, actually. And so I want to make sure that next week I'm going to have four heroes available in the pool so that one way or another we can try to get things going. Um, I don't have the resources to increase the size of my roster. Uh, increases it to nine. What is it right now? I suspect it's something. It might be eight. Or, or it might even be seven. We'll, we'll have to see what happens next week. But hopefully I'll get um, at least two more deeds so that I can maybe upgrade my hero barracks. We'll see how it goes. And that's all I can spend on anything right now. So what we're going to do in the next video, we are going to embark on a proper dungeon run. Um, but we're going to have to put a cut in there for now. If you do like the series, please, please, please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments uh, or like, favorite, share the video, do all that stuff. And if you're new to the channel, hey, welcome and uh, please subscribe. Hope you enjoy it. And uh, no, I don't usually do these little shout outs every time, but it's a, it's a new Let's Play series. So it's doubly important to try to get uh, some love from all you guys. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.